closures. All right, am I on? Okay, I guess before I get started, um, some of you might be traveling this afternoon, so this is what you're looking at. Depending upon where you're going, there is some weather about um, to our area. Uh, this morning, I put out a winter weather advisory here. It's supposed to start <coughs> snowing this afternoon. Um, no huge snowstorm, but uh, you might be seeing a little bit of snow this afternoon. They're talking about one to two today, one to two tonight, two to four tomorrow. So if you're going to stay around a little while, um, you might be experiencing some of, uh, some of that white gold we get around here. Um, so let's go to the PowerPoint. And if you got any questions on travel, uh, I'll be here all day. Okay, so uh, 2014 severe weather. Um, this picture is of a tornado. It actually is in Teller County there, but it started in Park County and moved east into Teller County. Um, this was the strongest tornado we had all year. Elevation somewhere 8,000, 8, 8,500 feet. Uh, and uh, we, we had uh, an entire, Roger said it was a good year, it was an entirely normal year. Okay, 49 tornadoes recorded in the state. Our average is, is 50. We had moisture, we had thunderstorms, uh, so normal is actually abnormal because the previous two years we were quite low on tornadoes. We were in the 20s, we were dry, we were hot. Last year, uh, I don't know down your, your area, Steve, but I think Denver got to 100 once the whole summer. It was a delightful summer. <laughs> And we didn't have any fire issues last year either, which, which was, you know, a, a nice break. So anyway, I worked for these these two uh, agencies, as does Steve, as does Rich. Uh, we talked yesterday. Um, we are the ones that uh, try to second guess Mother Nature and alert you to hazards. And I'm going to make one plug for spotter training. Uh, I will be doing spotter training one this afternoon for anybody who uh, is going to stay here. Uh, anybody who's new to chasing, it is a really important thing to do just to hook up with your local weather service and get that spotter training uh, and uh, know who you're going to be reporting to. So one more plug for reports to the weather service. All right, Steve showed a different version of this yesterday, but I want to go right back. Um, everything that happens here is happening on this backdrop. And so one of our challenges as, as forecasters and uh, chasers is trying to guess what that wind is going to do on this backdrop. If wind is blowing uphill, this is great. It's upslope. It, you get condensation. You get precipitation. If the wind is blowing the other direction, it's downslope, and all you get is wind. And so uh, some of our more spectacular bad forecasts over the years have been, we guessed wrong. Um, we, we thought it was going to be upslope, but it was downslope. And you'll get to experience a little bit of, the, of this upslope here this afternoon and tonight uh, as we get a cold front come down and the wind blows uphill and we get a little bit of snow as a result. So here are our tornadoes last year by county, 49 total. Uh, we keep track of total tornadoes and tornadoes by county, so the number is a little bit different. The one tornado traveled from Park to Teller County. And again, that was the only EF2 tornado. Everything else was EF0 and EF1 last year. And if we look at our numbers going back to 1950, by county, if you are going to be a chaser in Colorado, you have better luck east of I-25. We get away from the foothills and we see more tornadoes east of I-25. The top three counties are in red there. So well, Adams, you saw uh, <coughs> yesterday that Adams County is a bullseye, uh, partially because of that Denver cyclone. Uh, and then Washington County, because of their terrain, they get a number of tornadoes as well. We can't exclude tornadoes out in the west or even now in higher terrain. If I showed you this map five years ago, the number for Park County is zero. <coughs> it's 
So now we're seeing more tornadoes at altitude as well. Here's the numbers going back through the last 40 years. And this was done a couple years ago, so I don't have 2011, 12, or 12, 13, or 14 here. So um, notice it's highly variable year to year. If you get a low year, uh, you almost always get a higher year the next year. And for the last 20 years, we've averaged, averaged about 50 tornadoes a year in Colorado. So we are the ones that these local offices of the Weather Service that are trying to put out these warnings. Uh, in addition, we are the ones doing fire weather forecasts, aviation forecasts, looking at social media, doing all these other things. Um, in Colorado, there's four offices that do this, the Boulder office, the Pueblo office, Grand Junction, and Goodland. Um, in addition to the severe weather, we are um, uh, we're dealing with weather from 14,000 feet down to 4,000 feet and all the variability that entails. So we put out Storm, we put out warnings by the storm, and so this is just an example of last year, about one week of warnings mid-June last year in our area. Uh, notice that they don't neatly adhere to political boundaries. Uh, so if you're listening you get a warning, it might be for the part of the county you're not in. So it's, a good, <coughs> it's, it's good to actually get the details. Um, a warning might include, it, uh, we are in a, uh, let's take Arapahoe County, so Long Thin County south of here. Uh, we could have this warning out for the eastern part of Arapahoe County, east of Bennett, not impacting the western part. And so it's it's, uh, uh, it's all based on that storm and which way it's going. So the media is very interesting on what they decide is that a important story. So I was approached last September and said, what is this? Denver has put out more warnings for tornadoes than any other weather service office. <laughs> so we, you know, so you see 81 there. Highest in the nation. I think more notable is 8 at Fort Worth, 7 at Norman, so uh, the Midwest was being blanked while we're putting out quite a few warnings in our area. Now, uh, we didn't keep this record. Uh, we had an outbreak in December down in the southern states, and Jackson surpassed us. Yay, Jackson. So there you go. But this is courtesy of the uh, Iowa Environmental Net Mezzanine. Keep interesting <coughs> statistics there. Okay, so one of the things I looked at, okay, uh, why did we put out so many warnings? So if you just compare us to a random sample of other weather service offices and look at the size of these warnings, because it is going to vary from office to office to office to office, uh, you know that some offices put out larger size warnings. And there's nothing wrong in this because we know some storms move 50 miles an hour and some move 10 miles an hour. Sometimes you've got to put out a larger warning because that storm is quickly going to run out of the warning. Um, but uh, this just gives you an idea of the variability in this was average size for 2014. Okay, so if you go to the Storm Prediction Center website, they have a really neat in tornado environmental browser. So what I have here is the Norman, <coughs> looking at Norman, uh, Oklahoma. You notice there's a lot of long track tornadoes here, and the colors indicate some pretty strong long track tornadoes. And their average numbers include Cape of about 2,000, Shear uh, a little under 50, Helicity a little under 200. And if you look at uh, right moving supercells, those numbers are a little bit higher. Now let's compare that to Colorado. So we go to northeast Colorado, and you know that we don't get a lot of long track tornadoes. We don't get a lot of violent long track tornadoes. When I looked at the numbers here, 
94% of the tornadoes here were EF0, EF1, 6% were EF2, EF3. And our numbers here uh, for Cape are a little over a thousand. You know, a lot of you aren't going to chase for a Cape of a little over a thousand, but that is the average Cape for this area. Uh, Shear, a little over 40, and Elicity about 100. Now let's go back to the front range and see what it looks like. Oh, I should also point out, let me go back. This is the time of year you see in Norman. You heard yesterday that uh, our Texan goes to Nebraska in June because it shuts off down there. Maybe a little bit in early June, you still have some tornadoes in Texas, but May is the month for the Midwest, Oklahoma and Texas. If we go to Northeast Colorado, you know that we get started May, but we extend it to June and we start to taper off in July. If you go to the front range in Colorado, you see that uh, we are getting our tornadoes with capes under a thousand. Our shear is a little over 30 and our helicity is under 100. Some of you are not traveling to Colorado to find tornadoes. Um, time of year. We start ramping up in May. Our peak week is the first week of June. We get a lull right there at the end of July and then we pick up a little bit again in, uh, during July. The nice thing about tornadoes in Colorado is virtually all of them are in daylight hours. In the PM. So afternoon and evening. Now out in eastern Colorado we can get some tornadoes after dark. But most of our tornadoes you can see them coming. Okay, so this, what I'm going to show you is not so much what happened last year, but some notable events we've had. This was in Colorado. This was uh, the view from a security camera of the tornado that went up through Windsor. Notice that this is, uh, uh, we transplanted something from Oklahoma to Colorado here. Um, I would have said we don't get too many wedge tornadoes, but here is one, and it's fairly close to the metro area. And a lot of people did not recognize, well, Virtually no storm chasers were on this storm. Um, and the people that were impacted did not recognize this as a tornado because they're used to seeing combs and tubes. So what happened this, this event? Uh, oh, look at this, another upper low. Now Steve showed one. Look at Meridiano Flow. Meridiano Flow, upper low, southerly flow up across eastern Colorado. <coughs> And I could, I could show you many big events, and we've got this upper low to our west, including the flood of 2013. Uh, this, now beware of national maps, surface maps in areas of terrain. Okay, so it shows a big low somewhere in eastern Colorado. There's a warm front you see in eastern Colorado. This air mass right here is cool, moist, and unstable. And that's the environment in which that tornado formed. So this is just a loop of reflectivity on this event. This line right here is a warm front. And that was the initiating, that's that warm front you saw on the previous slide. The storm formed on that warm front, and then with that flow that Steve pointed out, raced off to the north-northwest. We had a nice hook right before it went into the town of Windsor. So if I look at the, the velocity, We had something on the order of 90 knots a shear across that. And right before it hits Windsor, it goes up to about 
I should point out we have one fatality in this event, and that's right about that time frame, west of Greeley, um, at a uh, camping area. <coughs> right before this hits Windsor, we are at somewhere around 105 knots across that circulation. So that's what a mesocyclone looks like on radar. And that's a supercell storm, which we see every once in a while here in Colorado. So this is the uh, flow of information there, during this event. So 11, 18 a.m., and I already told you p.m. is when we see severe weather. So here's violation number one. Uh, watch is put out after the warning. This is something that happens here in Colorado because things develop so <coughs> fast. Sometimes we'll have warnings out before you get that tornado watch. Uh, 11.35, 11.53, 12.13, as this thing raced to the north at about 29 miles an hour. Okay, so the morning sounding had a uh, cape of about 1719, which is healthy for our area. Um, this cape, uh, was uh, 2850, and this was in uh, recalculated for that air mass in which that tornado formed. So that is a pretty nice cape for Colorado. If you're used to 4,000, 5,000 capes with your big storms, um, this is plenty enough for us. So there was a study that has just been submitted to the Journal of well, it's Cochrane et al. and a journal of geophysical something. Anyway, they were looking at uh, this event, and they look, they have a uh, we have uh, this is we got V-laps. They were looking at we got the profiler, we got the uh, upper air launch, and we have a, a microwave radiometer in your holder. And using all this data. They were able to look at. <coughs> Oops, hit the wrong button. Okay, so um, as the day unfolded here, um, this is sin, this is Cape, and so from 16 to 1700, we had Cape jump up, and they are calculating the Cape here at 2,550 joules per kilogram. So in an hour, it jumped while SIN went down to zero, and that is the time frame for that tornado. The other thing that, that was uh, maybe even more notable to me was uh, what kind of uh, storm relative <coughs> felicity you guys look at for your big tornadoes. <coughs> what? 150 or higher? Okay, so what we have here in red is um, zero to one kilometer, in green, zero to three kilometers, and we're seeing a storm relative elicity calculated in their data at 700. <coughs> so that's very, very localized. Okay, so. We are, another thing the media asks is how unusual was this? Okay, so this happened in May. That's when we see tornadoes in Colorado. This happened in Weld County. That's where we see tornadoes in Colorado. But this happened before noon. It was tracking north-northwest. It uh, was a mile wide. Uh, what else? Track length, 38 miles. Okay, you, you heard yesterday that we have a preponderance of tornadoes that are one-tenth of a mile. Here in Colorado, this is 38 miles. And this was the only, this was only the second EFT, AEF3 tornado in that area in the last 80 years. So if you haven't figured out by now, uh, meteorology is uh, a field in which records are meant to be broken.
All right, so here is a uh, uh, damage assessment for this event. Here is some of the damage we saw. <coughs> the fatality occurred in this truck at the campground. And I should note, Colorado had a long history of no fatalities from 1961 to uh, 2007. The Holly tornado, we had two fatalities in the Holly tornado. The next year, we had one fatality here in this tornado. I can ask an engineer how much wind is required to do this to a high tension power line, I'm not sure. Yeah, we were, we were figuring something around 130 on that. <coughs> this was a common picture in the town of Windsor. Uh, garages caved in, roofs damaged. Um, most of the damage in the town of Windsor was EF2. South of Windsor, uh, we calculated EF3. So that is a supercell tornado. And now you can just wipe that out of your mind. You can go back to the terrain. And because of the terrain, we have, as was discussed yesterday, we have a southeast wind out on the plains. Because of the Palmer Divide, that wind will get turned. And you'll end up getting a circulation in the south plant basin, somewhere in here which goes by the descriptive term Denver Cyclone. Okay, from the Denver Cyclone, there is a boundary that extends to the south, and we have winds converging into this boundary. Okay, so the, you can't do this forever. What happens is, as was discussed yesterday, you get swirlies on this boundary. Small circulations. And there might be a half dozen of these that develop along this boundary. And all you need is an updraft to come over the top of that, tilt that, spin that up, and you get the non-supercell tornado. And so places that favor that for us include Parker, Aurora, DIA, uh, and then up into southern Weldon County. So usually just on the east side of the metro area, this can, on, in some years, be over the metro area. So we had some of these in 1981 and 1988 in the city of Denver. But most of this is going to be just on the east side of the metro area. And these are favored in this area. And so what happens here is, uh, because I told you all you need is an updraft, typically the, the spotter or chaser reports this first. We put out the warning, and 10 minutes after we put out the warning, we see it on radar. <coughs> so this is the type of non-supercell tornado I'm talking about. So I'm going to show you the Southland Small Tornado and the DIA Tornado. So, these are examples. This was 2002. This was extreme southeast metro area. Uh, Aurora, this was in northern Douglas County. This was last year. This was on the arsenal. This tornado right here, uh, for whatever reason, they decided to evacuate DIA for this tornado. This wasn't even on DIA, but they saw it. And we all know how hard it is to determine distance to tornadoes, but they reacted and evacuated the airport as a result of that tornado. Never touched the airport. Here's another tornado from last year from Steve's area, Bend County. Uh, I will make one more plea for information from chasers. We had 49 tornadoes in the state, and we had seven pictures of tornadoes. 
So if you've got the pictures, please share them with us. We can show them. Again, this is another non-supercell tornado. All right, so I'm going to share with you uh, one that occurred two years ago. This was uh, right at the airport. That's your view uh, from the car lot, the, the rental car lot at the airport. Uh, what were we looking at this day? Except for the forecast surface cape, all these capes are somewhere between 440 and 900. So not huge cape numbers. We do have a really weak trough that's going to give us a little lift on this day. Uh, our outlook from SPC shows everything, slight risk. A little bit of hail outlook, a little bit of wind outlook. This is our discussion on this day. We're talking about a boundary on the, the uh, Denver Cyclone right over the airport. And we always put this spotter activation statement <coughs> our outlooks um, telling people that we might need reports from them. So there was a mesoscale discussion. I'll point out here that the two points here were in the low 40s. Uh, here's composite reflectivity from here to here to here to here to here. This storm right here is the one that produced the tornado. And here's our circulations. You've got circulation there, 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 and there. Anybody on this storm? Okay, this is the view from the satellite on this event. This is the view from the ground. This is right at Tracon, south of the airport. And if you happen to be going up Tanya Boulevard to the airport, this was your view. I'll have to confess, I did my master's thesis on thunderstorm gust fronts and wind shear many years ago, and I vowed never to fly in and out of Denver in the afternoon in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> this is why. And if you do, this is what you risk. Evacuation at the airport, the uh, tornado touched down off of airport property, went on the east side of the airport, these are the north-south runways, went between the runways, went and went right over uh, one of the wind shear sensors, and they recorded 109 miles an hour, and went over our uh, ASOS, and we recorded 97 miles an hour. The tornado went and approach Concourse A, turned and dissipated, causing no damage. And got rated EF1 because it went over a National Weather Service sensor. <laughs> At the same time, this was happening, if you remember, uh, I think it was El Reno, no, was it El Reno? Anyway, they, uh, they were not allowed to use mobile radars to uh, rate tornadoes. <clears throat> but again, since we, are, we had an established observing system, we did it here.
tornado that hit the Southlands Mall, which is on the southeast side of the metro area. Um, we had enough lift on this day to get some hail, and um, we got two windows broken here. So it's not, it wasn't a huge tornado, but um, it caused a fair amount of damage in the mall with uh, a caved in the uh, Lowe's roof, and uh, uh, there was a lot of roof damage in the mall. So this particular, you got the flavor yesterday that um, we have this whole gradation from very weak events to very strong events. So um, the one I showed you is the uh, DIA.